Hello everyone, my name is Jim Carr and I help my clients and audiences to grow their businesses through better everyday conversations. I do that through consulting, speaking, writing, and I have an idea of what at least some of you might be thinking. Grow, grow is nice, uh, but our growth plans have been at best paused and maybe just completely changed altogether. And so I'm trying to hang on tight right now, but at the same time, maybe to find some things that I can do to begin growing again in whatever our next level of normal is going to look like and whenever that does happen. And I think that's a lot of the benefit from what we can talk about here in a virtual summit format and uh, the portfolio of advice and guidance and practical help that you might be able to get across our leaders and speakers. And in my case, to think through messaging and how important that can be, not only the very immediate, but in the longer term in terms of uh, getting you back into a growth engine for uh, being able to, to grow and, and prosper again. When we come on the, the backside of, of all this, and again, whenever that, uh, that time frame is going to be. So, my, my talk today, my uh, guidance with you today, I call it continue to connect because we certainly need to keep connection, but it needs to be in an appropriate manner. How to manage your customer conversations through this crisis and beyond. And the idea is, uh, again, some, some encouragement, but also some practical tips and some areas of focus where you can make the best of this time that we have right now and also prepare yourself with a strong foundation of being able to grow your own expertise, your own renown, uh, and the, the growth opportunities that you have for your organization, whatever that looks like for you. And you think through of uh, this idea about connection, and I deal with lots of different kinds of businesses, all the way from software and medical devices and um, a lot of business to business services, even to some consumer work. And you think about where conversations happen, whether that be with your salespeople, delivery people, partners, other colleagues, but your current customers and clients and just friends in the community. Think about these as being wonderful mechanisms for you to be able to differentiate yourself, find more opportunities and, and more ways to serve. And we've been taken away from a lot of those natural settings, a lot of those natural scenarios and environments, haven't we? The uh, friends of, of, of current customers and friends just getting together and talking to selling in person to people gathering in their neighborhoods and communities and houses of worship and tailgating. Uh, I mentioned one of the, the companies that I, I used to work in and led marketing for uh, was in the delivery business, the homes and businesses of bottled water and case goods and coffee and those sorts of things. That, that human interaction uh, in the moment is a real growth opportunity, but that's not as available to us now. So we're dealing in, in virtual worlds and trying to keep it together, but also make sure we're positioned that when we do begin to have more uh, physical space sharing, when we do have uh, less social distancing and we get to back to being the social animals that we're meant to be, uh, are you and are your team members best equipped for that? We've been uh, getting at least around the car household lately. Uh, every now and then we've been getting this message, uh, your connection has been lost. And in a very practical, tangible sorts of way. We've got uh, several teenage sons who are doing remote school right now. And uh, with a lot, a lot of different, uh, our, our school's been trying to use Zoom and sometimes that crashes and you think of households and people are all kind of gathered in between, you know, Netflix and Zoom and, and all the other things that are putting great burdens on their systems and things are getting sometimes glitchy and, and overwhelmed. And in a sense, with our, our business worlds, our connections have been uh, lost as well. And just the, the reasons that I was talking about of some of the more everyday natural points of connection to customers and prospects 
So taking that into account of, of what is true in the very near term, let's first say we do need to remain connected. We need to do so in a helpful way. I don't know if um, you have been subject to any like this, but I've been getting spammy messages a lot via email, via LinkedIn. Uh, people who I really don't have a connection to have said that they're thinking about me and they've got a great idea a particularly a way that uh, I could spend money with them to, uh, to help myself, my family, my business. Uh, that's very salesy. We don't want to be needy. We don't want to be smarmy. We do want to be helpful, but also in a way that can keep those relationships, keep those connections, position ourselves appropriately. So it's really helpful for both parties. So how do we do that? That's the first thing to acknowledge the need of what we have. And then I thought we could talk about two different areas of focus to help you put a little bit more strategy and some takeaways from that. The first is where to focus if you want to build your trustworthiness. This is a time where we need, we need trusted sources and we, need, uh, we want to be acknowledged for our trustworthiness. What I found over time, not just in the present uh, pandemic, but in general, a lot of really good professionals and a lot of good businesses are approaching that in a skewed way. They're not uh, doing as strategic a, a job as they could of building the trustworthiness. We'll talk about a, a way to make sure that you're hitting the mark appropriately. And secondly, a simple strategic model for making customer conversations a growth engine. And it's both in the immediate term, but importantly, beyond the, the worst part of the pandemic when that is passed and whatever the next level of normal looks like, how can you get that messaging right so that you can best take advantage of what lies on the other side? So let's think about um, ways that you can uh, get some takeaways. We can learn from uh, a lot of areas like social psychology, brain science, and practical experience of how to get the most out of it. And let's start with this area of trustworthiness. I don't know any businesses, any great professionals who haven't over time set some sort of goal of how they want to be perceived usually as some sort of trusted advisor. They want to have a consultative relationship. They want to be seen as a trusted source. And these professionals and these companies do have a lot to offer. They tend to know their stuff. So this is very important and no time like the present to build that trustworthiness. But again, I wanted to share uh, some ways that uh, unfortunately a lot of um, people who know their stuff don't approach this issue of building trustworthiness in, in quite the most strategic sense or the most helpful sense where it could be. So let's, let's turn our attention to that next. This whole idea of trust, and uh, we know that is both a, a short-term thing that we want to make sure we build and, and, and be seen as a place where people, your customers, your clients, your prospects can turn into a time where we have particular pressing needs. Now, a lot of a lot of people, though, take a look at this and they believe or they act as if they believe that establishing trustworthiness is really a single factor. It is about proclaiming and asserting their expertise. And this feels really good and objective. And certainly your expertise, your domain knowledge, knowing what to do is foundationally important. It's also uh, an area that, that feels really comfortable to talk about. These are the things that you uh, get searched on. These are things you can put in your LinkedIn profile on your website. It's your years of experience, your credentials, your certifications, education, all of those things together. And it, and it feels very objective and cool and logical and defensible, which I think is one of the reasons why it becomes um, almost the exclusive foundation for establishing trustworthiness. But what I found over time and what psychology tells us is that it's not quite enough. It's only half the picture. What you really need to do to be fully trustworthy is to have both expertise and empathy. 
not sympathy, empathy, which is an understanding of the other person's situation and, and the language and the, the pressures uh, that they're dealing with right now. And you think through uh, expertise and empathy as these two important factors, which I believe to uh, need to be present in roughly equal parts for most of us professionals. If you were dealing with somebody who lacked both expertise and empathy, well, they're not worth talking to. If it's someone who has expertise, but you didn't believe they really got you, they didn't really understand your situation, you could probably acknowledge their expertise, but just say, it's not for me. It's better for somebody else. If it's someone who hasn't been able to demonstrate uh, and assert their expertise, but they have empathy, well, they might be a good shoulder to cry on, but um, and they might make you feel better in the moment, but they really can't help you solve your problems. But as a uh, trustworthy, as a caring professional, you want to be able to, to show both, that you know what you're talking about, but you also um, will get a level of understanding of that other person that any recommendations you make are based on their situation and your, um, your understanding of that. So it's not a one size fits all kind of approach. That's what it is to be really helpful in those professionals, those teams and companies that um, are perceived as knowing their stuff and understanding the particulars of their customer or prospect. Well, those are the ones that really do become the trusted advisors. They become the go-to relationships. Um, and so let's talk about the crucial role of customer conversations um, for doing that. So again, we've got this, uh, this idea, this imperative that we want to build trustworthiness. Here's where I see some professionals and businesses lag behind or they fall into kind of a comfortable trap as I've illustrated here. But those who have really made this the, the basis for growing uh, their business and growing their opportunities uh, take a few extra steps. So at the, at the most base level, there is the credibility. There's your, your expertise, right? There's what you know how to do. There, this first level trap I find uh, with some professionals is they just stop there. They kind of figure if, look, if I establish my, what do you call it, thought leadership or expertise or credibility that um, I'll be found, especially in a world where people can find you. But there's a lot of noise out there and a lot of misinformation and a lot of static. So the next level is going beyond just your credibility into this middle piece where we're adding in our relationships, the people whom we know, whom we have served, or we um, uh, believe would be good people for us to, to be able to serve, nurturing those relationships. It's another maxim that we hear very often, and it's true. And people will say, ours is a relationship business. There's nothing more important than our portfolio of relationships. So we want to be able to apply our credibility, our capacity to help into uh, those important relationships. But even that, with that addition, can be a bit of a trap if you stop there. How many times have you heard, or I have certainly heard and sometimes may have even said, you know, we've got these relationships, but um, they, that person doesn't want to buy from us. They don't want to do business from us. They're not willing to take that step. So we can be friends and we can be friendly, but somehow something is missing. They don't see what I do as being applicable or relevant to them. And so that gets us to this last step of client conversations, of engaging in uh, asking questions, answering questions, offering some insights, but listening to the particulars of that situation. It is the only way that you can both deepen your understanding of the other person's situation to build empathy and also demonstrate through the stories that you share, through the questions that you ask to demonstrate your empathy. Otherwise, it's just a little cool and sterile. This is how we want to get there. And that is the link from the necessity, the imperative of building your trustworthiness to actually how do you do that? How do you um, and do that in a strategic way uh, and in a very structured, manageable sort of way as well. So that is going to be the, uh, the, the last piece that I want to talk about here, which is 
an area that I, I call managing the message, but it's about this, this notion of proactively planning for and engaging in the right sort of customer conversations, keeping those connections strong, and importantly, equipping other people to be able to do that in a consistent way too. What I find is that, um, very simply put, really good conversation management, really managing the message is um, a three component process. And, and I'll, I'll show you here a, a very um, uh, simple model uh, that I've developed as well. It has the, these three components. It almost looks like a, uh, a bit of a, a flywheel or pinwheel of message, of messengers, and of managing that process. And it really is, as much as anything, a three-legged stool. I've got a, a nice picture here. Also have a bit of a lunky prop sometimes. An actual three-legged stool. And I want to think of it that way because like a three-legged stool, you know, you gotta have you gotta have three strong legs. Uh, or else the, the thing will fail and it'll fail in a predictable direction, in a predictable way. It will go into the direction of the weakness. And so let's talk about how these pieces fit together in a very simple and practical way, what it means, um, how you can diagnose where might be the low hanging fruit for you, the area to address first for yourself and for your organization, and also um, what that looks like. So how, do you, how would you diagnose particular issues? Here are the ones that I see most commonly. So if a specific leg is weak, and one of the particular components of this model is weaker than the other two, then you might see evidence of commodities, crickets, and cowboys. I'll tell you what each of these means and, and what you can do to, to break free from that and make sure that your business is prospering in an unusual and distinct sort of way. So Commodities is when your message is not distinct, is you're kind of like everybody else. And, and it's difficult, you might see that uh, and your sales team is, is having difficulty with win rates. You might um, find that you're just not uh, considered, you don't uh, have a lot of pricing power, you're, you're kind of thrown into the mix by potential buyers. That probably means that your offerings may be good, but your messaging isn't distinctive in a way. We'll talk about how to break free of that. Crickets, and that harkens back to uh, my childhood in southern end of Georgia. And on summer nights, uh, you could hear the crickets chirping because there really wasn't much else going on. It was, it was really quiet out there. And the crickets chirping means that growth is hard to come by, whether you're trying to find net new business or you're trying to sell more of what you do to an existing customer or client base, or maybe a little bit of both, is if growth is hard to come by, it might mean that you could use a lot more people who can share that message and help connect you and help talk you up and provide referrals and testimonials and be able to connect you to larger opportunities. And the third part is cowboys. This is a consistency issue. And we'll talk again specifics here in just a moment. But if the idea is that people who know your business in the inside or the outside and can talk about it, are they doing so in a consistent way? Or kind of like the cowboy, they're just going to do it their own way. So if there's a lot of inconsistency, if people don't know the same things about you, don't talk about you in, in any way that, that tends to be similar got a consistency issue and that, that comes to some weaknesses in management and habits and processes to try to bind all of this together. Let's talk about this first part uh, and when it's a commodity and that's, that's a message issue. And, and in a commodity world, everyone pretty much looks and sounds the same. Now, this is a, a, a frustration that happens. Uh, that again, I see lots of times. It's just the actual words that we use to describe ourselves, the stories that we share, the specific questions that we ask, the evidence, the visuals, the data that we bring to the marketplace to try to make the complex simple. And uh, this is a tough one. You know, it doesn't come uh, that easily. Um, we can give ourselves a break about why developing the right message 
can be so difficult, even for people who have something particularly valuable to offer, really know their stuff. The fact is our brains lead us in the wrong direction. Our brains reward us for talking about ourselves. It, it light, lightens the, uh, the areas of our brain um, that are responsible for, for pleasure, all right? So uh, the, same, the same parts of our brains that get activated when we have a great meal are the ones that we, when we're talking about ourselves. So our brains kind of work against this. They have us talking a little too much about ourselves rather than about the other person or asking questions about them. And it's also easy if you're in a particular company or specifically a particular industry is that people in that group start carrying the same lingo. They start using the same language, the tribal knowledge and language over time. And that's why a lot of, well, I don't want to pick on bankers here, but there's a lot of complaint. All bankers sound the same. Um, they, they, uh, people that are in, uh, in construction tend to use a lot of the same lingo, people who are in manufacturing or particular services. And it's part of what binds a community together, kind of what makes it fun if you're meeting at an industry association or getting together within your group. But that becomes pretty obscure to the rest of the world. And, and a lot of people don't even realize the extent to which they do this. So it's important to, to know that we're fighting against our brains and we're fighting against our industry and our habits and our lingo and our acronyms, um, all of those things as well. The best way to start breaking free from that is understand probably the most powerful single word in messaging, which is the word you. And, and look at your website, your LinkedIn profile, your, um, uh, the, whether you have a pitch or a capabilities presentation or whatever those things might be, and actively look for more ways to talk about the other person, to get more simple language, and uh, to break free of our brains and our industry. And, uh, and that way, the message itself uh, can be much more distinctive. The second part is about the crickets are chirping. That's a messenger issue. And uh, I think there are assumptions and our insecurities may hold us back. So if our brains and our industry may be uh, a roadblock when it comes to the message, I think our, our assumptions and insecurities hold us back when it comes to developing a big, robust network of messengers. What do I mean by that? Well, for two generations, we have assumed that extroverts are the most influential and high-performing salespeople. We've learned in, in recent years, Adam Grant was among the researchers who uh, led the way to actually test that proposition. And what he found and what others have found subsequently is that extroverts aren't necessarily the most effective salespeople. They're not effective necessarily the most persuasive folks. Uh, in fact, if you think of a continuum of introverts to extroverts, the introverts and the extroverts themselves are about equally effective, but it's people in the middle who are known as ambiverts, the people that I call the nimble majority, are actually the most effective. And that describes most people in the population, why I call them the nimble majority. They're not at one end of the continuum uh, or the other, they're, they're kind of a mix. And most of us are naturally wired for good conversation. We tend to give and take, we ask and we answer. And, and for those, whether it's you or, or your colleagues or your current customer base, even if they are on the introverted side of things, they have a great capacity for, um, for helping out as a messenger and want to be able to to be part of that too. The extroverts, the same way. They have great capacity and great energy when it comes uh, to, to engaging in conversation and being proactive and, and wanting to tell the story. There's a place for everyone. And, and so don't let uh, some assumptions about your capacity that you need to be some particular personality type or some particularly skilled communicator. No, it really is just um, thinking through that everybody has a role and given a tiny bit of care and feeding, you can go from having uh, colleagues and customers to having a bigger and bigger group of raving fans who uh, can help you tell that story. The third piece about all this is the, uh, is the management piece. 
And the cowboy piece, when it kind of goes its own way, you know, as they say in the Wild West, the cowboys tended to follow their own rules. And we like the autonomous spirit of the cowboy, the get it done attitude. But if you're leading an organization, if you're trying to even just get more testimonials, if you're trying to get everyone, uh, quote unquote, on the same page in terms of the value that you offer and how to talk about it, uh, left to its own devices. If you just kind of leave it to the marketplace, you're going to get a lot of inconsistency. Now, this doesn't mean uh, to make it overly scripted. We don't, uh, we don't look at this as being a, a robotic process in, in any way at all. But um, people need certain knowledge and skills and confidence. And in the management piece, I think what holds us back oftentimes is past habits, maybe bureaucratic procedures, and sometimes where I find uh, a past failure. So if there was a big promotional campaign, if there was a new initiative or product launch or strategic focus or whatever, and it, it didn't meet expectations, then that becomes part of the internal conversation. Oh boy, well, that was the flavor of last month. And so if we're trying to talk about ourselves in a better way, talk about ourselves in a more strategic way, then uh, people kind of tend to discount it, this too shall pass. So the way to really break f uh, free from, from those limiting assumptions and those limiting areas of history is to first of all, make it easy. So what we wanna do is bring the story, the message, the socialization into the ways that people already meet and coach and socialize all of this. We don't need to make it a new initiative. We need to weave it in to our organizational culture. The other thing that I uh, advise clients and I would advise anybody, uh, if you're going to do this yourself, is for the people that you want to carry this message, that you want to be messengers, involve as many of them as you can in the creation of the message itself. You'll build more, uh, not only a better, better product, but you'll develop a lot more credibility inside, more street cred, more momentum, and people will feel it uh, is more of their own. And, and so that way you'll get all of these pieces working together. You'll get a good message, you'll develop more messengers, and you'll get some new habits um, asserted internally. And, um, and that's where you're gonna build not only the, the near-term capacity to start looking at the changes in our world and, um, and to be able to talk about your business today as we're getting through this COVID-19 pandemic and beyond, um, but also to position yourself where you'll come out on the, um, the other side of this as being distinctive, to have a message that is at, at level of your value. And it's something that's spread with enthusiasm and it's spread more consistently. And this can be a growth part of the business. Why do we talk about messaging in this context? Well, I tell you, when, when things are changing so quickly and so dramatically, and we're dealing with not only uh, objective facts and strategic positioning and all that, but people's fears and anxieties and hopes, how we talk about ourselves, the questions that we ask, the stories that we share, this is fundamentally important. And you can change your messaging a lot faster and a lot more easily than you can change your products or your pricing or your business model or your partnerships, any of that. So this is a way for us to best represent the value of what we do. And it's a way for us to be agile and to be responsive and to build those connections and demonstrate our empathy as well as our expertise. Now, those are some things that I um, would highly encourage you to keep in mind that this is an opportunity to revisit what you're doing to take a look at, are you talking about yourself and are you presenting about yourself in a way that doesn't just show your expertise and your, your vision and your why, but also your understanding, your deep understanding of your customer situation, your prospect situation, and the ways that you can help. And then are you looking at this as a manageable business problem, a manageable business issue? So whether your symptoms are crickets, commodities, or cowboys, what are the areas that you can best address right now in terms of clarity of message, in terms of building your network of messengers, 
and in terms of establishing some management habits and some processes and some ways of socializing and encouraging so that you get more consistency. If you can do that, then and you're going to definitely stand out and have a lot more opportunities in the very near term than you would have had, and you'll be very well positioned as we come out of, uh, come out of this pandemic and, uh, and all the disruption that we've unfortunately um, been having to deal with right now. Uh, when it comes to connection, I invite a connection with you. And my new book um, which summarizes a lot of this called The Science of Customer Connections, Manage Your Message to Grow Your Business. I'd encourage you if you're looking at uh, some ideas and practical steps that you can put into, um, into action yourself. And you can find it in both in paperback and Kindle and audio books where basically wherever you get business books. I also would invite you to connect with me. LinkedIn is my social platform of choice. You can follow me on Twitter. I have a regular podcast, the Manage Your Message podcast as well. There's my uh, email and um, I uh, would happy to be a sounding board for you if there's some ideas here that you'd like to explore in greater detail, but definitely do reach out, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, there are a lot of free resources that I have on my website. I also put my uh, direct phone number is on the website as well. We're going to talk about connection. I want to make sure that I am available to you uh, at a time when uh, we can help one another out and should be helping one another out. So I really um, appreciate this opportunity to speak with you. I hope it is the beginning of uh, a point where we can connect and that this is, is helpful for you. This uh, immediate uh, conversation uh, that we're having right now, as well as the, the greater portfolio here in this, this virtual summit. So uh, thank you so much. And I, uh, I hope uh, that we have a chance to have conversation soon. And uh, more than anything else, I hope that, uh, that your story, your business story and your business value is shared well and is shared often.